Hello everyone, my name is Anton Pelcher. I'm an engineer and I have been building fish farms for more than 10 years. Today we will talk about such an interesting topic as the difference between a large fish farm and a small or medium one. What is the general difference in the approach to the construction of large fish farms and how to implement this project optimally, save as much as possible while not losing money in vain? Why can I even talk about it? Let's start with this. Well, in 2015, I launched my first big, really large-scale fish farm project that was already eight years ago. It was a sturgeon farm in Azerbaijan, about 10,000 square meters, which is actually the size of a soccer stadium. It was a really serious project that I started my path as a RAS engineer with. For the moment being, my biggest project is a 25,000 square meter farm, consisting of several buildings. Therefore, I understand something about large farms. Of course, I get new experience every day, but nevertheless, I know a lot about such large-scale projects, how they are implemented. So let's go. I will share with you my personal experience, and it's up to you to judge. To begin with, a large project differs from a small or medium-sized one, probably like a sort of manual production from a Ford assembly line. That is, if it is a small farm, you can neglect a number of technological operations. Then in a large farm, they are mandatory and necessary. Well, for example, the first thing is moving, transferring fish. How do you transfer fish at a small and medium-sized farm? You take a net, walk up to the tank, skipping. At most, you put on high boots and literally dive into the tank. Pull the fish out and sell it. Everything is fine. Now imagine how to deal with that if your farm had the capacity of 500 or 1000 tons a year. By the way, a large industrial farm is about 200 tons of sturgeons and trout and from 500 to 1000 tons of African catfish per year. A large farm for trout is probably even from 500 tons. So let's move on. So you grow, for example, 500 tons of trout per year. What to do with it? How to move it and how to sell it? But you are not going to hire a number of people who are going to run around with nets, pulling fish out of the tanks. No, it's just absurd. So the first major difference is automation, transferring and sorting the fish. At any large farm, fish is not moved by nets, but is discharged from the tanks or channels with special equipment or pulled from there. Fish is immediately pumped out by fish pumps, is also transferred by pumps, then automatically sorted as a rule because you have not only to move the fish but also to sort and is automatically moved further for shipment. This all, I emphasize again, is done manually at small farms. This is the first difference. The next difference is the feeding process. If it is a small farm, you need to feed, for example, 100 kilograms, that is 4 to 5 bags of feed per day. Well, it can be done manually without any problems by the operators. But imagine if you need to feed to the fish, for example, a couple of tons of feed per day. How do you imagine that the operators carry out it manually? In this case, you would have to hire a number of manpower. Why do that when there is a special, dedicated feeding system? We are not just talking about automatic feeders where you fill the feed into the hoppers with your hands again. We're talking about pneumatic feeding systems, usage at large farms. When you have large hoppers concentrated in one place, one location of the farm, feed is delivered there, and it's automatically distributed by pneumatic lines all over the farm to each tank. Next, and very important, this is a different approach, a fundamentally different approach to fish tanks. And if it is a small and medium-sized farm, you can easily put some tanks, provide overflow, something will work somehow. Then at a large farm, this is won't work at all. If a tank size, for example, has 1, 2, 300 cubic meters of volume, maybe even 500 cubic meters, technologically proper water supply and drainage are critical, because you have a huge amount of fish biomass in the tanks and can't take risks. Secondly, you need to ensure uniform circulation of water. Whether it's a tank or channel, you need to ensure even removal of dirt and uniform distribution of oxygen to the tanks. And also, if you have large tanks, how do you handle dead fish? How do you deal with fish catching? That's when all these issues get pretty serious. You can't fix all the issues by means of a man or two jumping from 100 cubic meters tank to another and chasing fish with a net, even if this man is wearing flippers. So the approach into fish tanks is really completely different. 
that is, there is a special water supply and drain system. Next difference is the maximum automation of dispatching and control. If owners of small farms come to me for advice, is it worth to provide for maximum automation? As a rule, I say that it's not worth that. Why not? Because automation is expensive, and when you apply it at a small farm, you get such a doubtful result while spending a lot of money. But if we are talking about a farm of 500 or 1000 tons of fish a year, I insist on the fact that it's necessary. It's basic equipment at a farm like that. Well, imagine, you have got 200 to 300 tons, 500 tons of fish in the tank simultaneously, and you are risking all that fish in case something goes wrong. And Murphy's Law says that if something can go wrong, it goes wrong. So maximum redundancy, standby units and maximum dispatching of automation from a personal computer. No manual control with the help of control panels, and this is no longer the case at a large industrial farms. The next thing is a centralized oxygen supply. That is, if small farms usually use medical oxygen concentrators, some simple solutions, yes, this is reasonable, this is fine. But at a large industrial farm, you should have a large oxygen station and also some kind of backup either a tank with liquefied oxygen or a standby oxygen station, the kind of oxygen station which supplies the whole complex with pure technical oxygen, which is needed for fish breathing, for the process of ozonation and so on. Well, and the next is a most, your own hatchery. Imagine a production of 500 or 1000 tons per year and that you buy fry stuck in material. But I have never seen such a thing in my life. Of course, you must necessarily, obligatory, get your own stocking material. First of all, it's cost reduction, and second is independence, because dependence on third-party suppliers for such a huge volume of stocking material is often fatal. The next difference presumes using tanks and reservoirs made of concrete. Imagine you need to make tanks of two, three, four hundred cubic meters, making them out of plastic. It's no longer appropriate. If it's appropriate to make small tanks out of plastic, large tanks are made of concrete all over the world. There is nothing better that mankind has yet invented. Concrete is reliable, concrete is durable, and you can still make tanks of all shapes and sizes. So if you have a large industrial farm with large tanks, be prepared for a large amount of concrete work. And probably the last thing I've already partially mentioned is that maximum redundancy of pumps and blowers, oxygen, electricity, is a must at such a farm. Because you have tens, hundreds, thousands of dollars swimming in your tanks, and to risk that amount of money in order to save a couple of hundred dollars on a backup pump, I don't think it makes sense. Let's move on to equipment. Where to buy equipment for such a large industrial farm? Well, let's take a wider look at what is happening in the world. For example, let's take America. I don't know why, just to start with the equipment produced there. Frankly, US equipment is imported into my country very rarely. Why? Because in Europe, there is practically the same equipment which is not worse, if not better. Taking into account logistic issues, economic ties with Europe, so honestly, I've almost never encountered cases when equipment was imported from USA to Russia. Well, it's just not practically feasible. Let's take China. China is an interesting market, but I honestly say that Russian local producers have learned to make equipment no worse than in China. At the same time, it costs the same or even cheaper. So no matter how much we try to look for equipment in China, we either find low-quality equipment there, or we find equipment that costs more expensive than in Russia, and therefore there is no point in importing it from China, except perhaps for oxygen stations, perhaps the ozonation system, but it has its own peculiarities as far as China is concerned. Next is Europe. Of course, what is worth buying from Europe is pumps. Germany and Italy are very good and reliable pumps manufacturers. Blowers. It makes sense to buy them in Germany, although they are also produced at a good quality level in Russia. The assembly is partly not Russian, but nevertheless the brand is Russian. Ultraviolet dose and tanks, all this can be found in Russia in abundance, excellent quality. What else does it make sense to buy from Europe? Perhaps the drum filters of very high capacity, if you need super reliability, super quality. It's really better to order drum filters of high capacity from Europe. Well, I think that it's worth to purchase everything else in Russia. That is, today for a small or medium-sized farm, it's worth buying everything except the pumps in Russia. If we take a large industrial farm, you can add to the pumps, and I emphasize that compressors, and in some cases the drum filters. 
Surely my conclusions might not be of particular interest to you, as I mostly refer to my country when making comparison. However, I presume that you will find similarities with the realities of your countries. Now let's proceed to the design issues. What is the difference between designing a small farm and a large-scale one? You need to run a 500 square meter farm or you need to run a 10,000 square meter farm. What's the fundamental difference? The main difference is the following. At a 500 square meter farm, you can do things the easy way. That is, you can somehow make the building yourself maybe even without special design works to lay utility lines. Just make everything as simple as possible. At the same time, if you are constructing a 10,000 square meter building, you have to go through a whole series of stages. The first is the feasibility study. If you want to draw in any investments, you will definitely need the feasibility study and you go through it in full in order to get investments or loans and so on. Of course, a detailed business plan is presumed and it must be of high quality, thought of thoroughly. Secondly, you have to go through the design stage. The project is divided into several stages. Design stage is necessary to pass through the expertise and you have to go through the expertise in any case. If your farm building is more than a thousand and a half square meters, at least it's so in my country, or water supplies from an open water source or it discharges water into an open river. So in order to pass the expertise, the design stage is indispensable and not only the technology section, but the general building design section from the general designer and contractor. Honda its signatures and seal will conduct the entire project, including the construction. It's a very important point. Next, the detailed design documentation stage, because in order to build the building well without faults, you can't go wrong. You need a full-fledged high-quality detailed design documentation, which you can distribute further to all the contractors and fully assemble the facility. So I have outlined the nuances of design. And now let's talk about special aspects for an industrial farm construction. First, of course, large projects are not usually implemented easily. That presumes that trying to build a hangar of 10,000-20,000 square meters for those projects is utopia. Professional and reliable contractors are hired there. You have to be prepared for a large amount of concrete work, because most likely all the tanks are poured out of concrete. Perhaps it sometimes even makes sense to buy your concrete plant. Well, and probably the last thing I would recommend in terms of building construction and running such a large production is to accelerate the process of getting the first money by buying fry. That is, you initially negotiate with some contract production that grow fry and deliver your healthy stocking material. You don't spend on caviar, you don't wait, but immediately stock with different weights of fish, up to young fish of 500 grams. And thus you get first grow out fish for sale, though with high prime cost, but much quicker. Of course, this is very superficial. We can go into it endlessly, but I hope that for the primary understanding it was useful to you. If so, press the like button, subscribe to my channel. This is Anton Pelcher and my channel on how to grow fish and make good money from it. Bye!